How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the channel. I hope you're having a wonderful day and that you're ready to dive in and nerd out on the Blackmagic Micro Studio 4K G2. If you're new around here, my name is John Castillo. I'm a professor and audiovisual producer based in Toronto. Now, I've used these Micro G1 cameras for many, many years. I've live streamed and broadcasted numerous prominent orchestras to some of the biggest classical music networks in the world. Before we get started though, full disclosure, Blackmagic did send me these cameras for the purpose of making this video. I did not get paid for this video and Black Magic does not get to watch the video beforehand. So the original Blackmagic Micro Studio 4K G1, Blackmagic and their naming convention, came out in 2015, priced at $1,295. And then the G2 came out in 2023, priced at $995. This was an eight year gap, the largest gap among Blackmagic Design's camera generational updates. So you can imagine that this wasn't just some rinky dink hardware improvement. There is a lot to unpack here. And honestly, I think they've done a superb job with this update. Let's start with the color, cause that's what my analytics show that people are most interested in. For those of you familiar with the Studio 4K G1 or G2, it's the same sensor and the color of the micro camera G2 look identical to the studio cams. Overall, massive color improvements. The image looks richer and more vibrant. But similar to its Studio 4K counterpart, I find that the G2 versions of these cameras with Gen 5 color science have a bit of a reddish tint in the shadows, at least in the first base ISO. Later in the video, I'll be talking about the color shift in the second ISO. The redness is honestly quite easy to fix, but it was a challenge when trying to match the Gen 5 color cameras with the older Gen 4 or even Gen 3 color cameras. I do like the pure blacks that the G1 micro camera had though, and there's certainly like this plain broadcast look that I can appreciate. But overall, the colors certainly look more modern and it'll match better with all the Gen 5 color cameras. Next, let's talk about the dual native ISO, a wonderful and very welcome improvement between the G1 and the G2. This results in much better low light performance, of course. I'll put a few comparisons on screen so you can peruse. Additionally, you can shift the G2 camera's gains by 2 dB increments as opposed to 6 dB increments which is very helpful for finessing exposure. However, the dual native ISO is not perfect. I mentioned this in my original Studio 4K Pro video, which I made two years ago, and it's still very much the case here. There is a noticeable color shift when you go from 8 dB to 10 dB of gain. Now look, I don't know what environments you are all working in, but in concert hall lighting, I always find myself hovering around 8 to 10 dB, which is just extremely unfortunate. Essentially, it means that I have to adjust the iris and the gain to compensate a bit for those potential color shifts. Now, I do find this to be way less of a problem with the micro cameras than with the Studio 4K or 6Ks because those are actually operated more often than not so there could be lighting adjustments that are required on the fly whereas the micro 4Ks are generally static so I can just sort of set them and forget them. Here's the color shift on screen and I'll zoom into the background a bit so we can pay attention to the noise and try to compensate for YouTube's compression. Hopefully it'll help a bit. It's not nothing like it, it's kind of noticeable, right? It's not just me. It goes from a bluish to a bit of a greenish hue. If you're the type of person to use these cameras in PTZ scenarios that require on the go exposure compensation, this is something to keep in mind. On the topic of color, let me tell you one of the best things about this G2 over its G1 counterpart the ability to choose different color profiles. Yes, you can actually select between video, extended video or film, or upload your own custom LUTs, something that was not possible with the G1. This is huge. It'll make matching between all of these cameras much more of a breeze. So here on screen right now, I'm showcasing the three different modes, video, extended video, and film, compared to the original G1 footage. In my opinion, the extended video is the one that is most similar to the original. And it's also the profile that we usually start our color adjustments from since it's not quite as contrasty as video. Additionally, this camera can record all of these settings to an external SSD via the USB-C port on the camera. Another massive win for the G2 over the G1, which had no recording capabilities at all. Now, while most people would probably record these micro cameras in a control room environment just to keep the footprint on stage or wherever you're recording these as small as possible, it's very beneficial to be able to record film internally, but then output through HDMI an extended video conversion LUT. That way you have full flexibility in post while still being able to get the extended video out of the camera. And of course, all of that with the Blackmagic RAW flexibility. Speaking of USB-C out of the camera, can we all just celebrate the fact that we don't have to use this thing anymore? Honestly, I didn't even mind this. I understand, I understand the need of an expansion port like this, especially when you have a piece of equipment that is small real estate. You need to keep the real estate small, and so you have something like this. If ever you needed to get more connectors on the device, it makes sense. But the fact that we needed to use this spaghetti monster just to power the camera seems like a bit of an oversight because by default, you always need to use this, thus making the footprint 
bigger every time. So let us celebrate. Look at this beauty. Power that plugs straight into the camera with no need for a spaghetti monster. A handshake will be available upon request after the completion of this video. Thank you, may I have a handshake? Anyways, moving on, let's talk about the SDI connectors real quick. The new G2 has 12G SDI, as opposed to 6G SDI from the G1, which is a welcome improvement, but the connectors themselves are different as well. The G1 used to have these DIN, D-I-N, connectors that were somewhat finicky, broke semi-regularly, and could be annoying to take out. You have to sort of master this pinching technique. The G2, however, has micro BNCs, and you can tell from the little sideway latch things. But honestly, I've never used these micro SDIs before, although I did accidentally buy them once, but then I never had anything to plug them into, so I never actually experienced it. I can imagine that, just based on the size, that there will be an improvement over the DIN connectors. But I don't know, maybe you've experienced micro SDIs. Let me know, drop me a comment. It's something to keep in mind for those of you who already had the old DIN connectors in your kit you will have to buy new cables. Up next, let's talk about the HDMI connector. A bit of a surprise to me, but the HDMI is limited to 1080p60, similar to the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras. It's a bit of a strange choice in my opinion, because the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras are cinema cameras first, and then they also have great multicam functionality as a secondary benefit. But these micro cameras, they're made for multicam production environments. So I would have thought that the HDMI port on these would be consistent with its cousins, such as the Studio 4K or the Studio 6K. Ultimately though, it doesn't really matter Matter because people will either A, use this camera's HDMI with an ATEM mini workflow, which is limited to 1080p anyways, or B, use this camera with an SDI workflow, in which case you're good to go, it's 12G. However, if you're the type of person who works with an HDMI fiber workflow and wants a 4K solution, then just keep this in mind. Also, you can use the HDMI to control the camera through an ATEM Mini, which was not the case with the original G1. Now, I've never actually used the G1s with an ATEM Mini before, to be honest. I've only ever used them with SDI workflow, so that was a bit of a surprise to me when making this comparison video, and it made the whole recording session much more difficult than it needed to be. To be fair though, the whole experience of using the micro cameras with an HDMI workflow is unideal, because you need to plug in a screen in order to frame the camera, so that's what the HDMI is there for. When working with an SDI workflow, you you can keep the camera plugged in via SDI and people in the control room can monitor while you frame the camera. If you're only using fiber HDMI, then you have to unplug the fiber in order to plug in the screen, then you know, frame the camera, unplug the screen, plug in the fiber, it's just not ideal. The G2 is smaller and really only comes with the power supply aside from the camera, whereas the original came with the camera, battery, expansion cable, the spaghetti monster, power cable, etc. So overall, huge improvements on this micro camera G2. For under $1,000, this camera packs a serious punch and has become much more useful through better low light performance, improved color science, custom LUTs, SSD recording, no spaghetti monster cable, and compatibility with the ATEM mini system. I straight up wanna swap out all of our G1s for G2s because it would improve our workflow in many ways and add more versatility. There's affiliate links below, and I'll be releasing videos on the Studio 4K G2 as well as the 6K Pro in the coming weeks. I'll put them here if they're already out. If not, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.